This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Welcome and thank you for joining Sister Power. Our topic for this episode is gen transgender voices from a native Hawaiian and transgender veteran. Transgender is an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to that typically associated with the sex to which they were assigned at birth. Gender identity refers to a person, internal sense of being male, female, or something else. Gender expression refers to a way a person communicates gender identity to others through behavior, clothing, hairstyles, voice, or body characteristics. Trans is sometimes used as shorthand for transgender. While transgender people are talked about in popular culture, academia, and science are constantly changing, particularly as individuals' awareness, knowledge, and openness about transgender people and their experiences grow. Welcome to Sister Power. Welcome, Valerie and Hina. How are you? Aloha. Aloha. Aloha to good. you. And Valerie and Hina, tell us a little bit about yourselves. T uh, tell the viewers about your childhood. I was born in Southeast Texas, November 1962. So I grew up in the Southeast Texas back in the 60s and 70s. And very large area was uh, very discriminatory. One of the largest chapters of the KKK was less than two miles from my home. So <clears throat> lived with that. My father was a policeman, so I and, and a homicide detective, and uh, he used to bring home some of his paperwork and caseloads, and uh, I got to see a lot of the pictures. And I kind of learned at an early stage that uh, in order for me to survive, I keep my feelings and my thoughts to myself. I, Hina, what about you? Tell me your story. I am a product of Hawaii in the 1970s. And at age 45 now, I look back and think upon my childhood here in the islands. Um, I wasn't necessarily someone who wanted to openly embrace what I knew from a young age in terms of my, not only my sexuality, but my gender expression. Um, but what is most striking about thinking back to that time is that Hawaii was a very, very different place. Mm. Hawaii was a place where everyone greeted each other. Everyone invited you over to their house. You could be walking by on the road and somebody will say, come in and come eat. Hey, how are you? Aloha, what are you doing? We never had to lock our doors. And we were always um, immersed in a sense of large community. And, and togetherness was, was something that was always the underpinning in what, whatever we did. But our community has changed. And so as a transgender woman living now here still in my home, it's, um, it's a very different place for me. Hawaii sounds like Southern hospitality. And when I was growing up in Virginia, this is how we lived, with our doors open, our neighbors embraced us with food, and I, I love Hawaii. I just love the spirit of aloha here. Well, tell us, what age did you know you were a transgender? I knew by the time I was seven years old that I was different. But back in the 68, 69, 70, there was no term for this and I recently after I retired from the Navy I had uh, done some researching and that's when I uh, around 2007 discovered it oh transgender 
that is what this is. This is what it meant. And then from there, I started doing more research online. I met my therapist, and then we had, uh, did a couple, count actually one consultation. And then she put me in contact with the doctor. In January of 2010, that's when I started my transition. That's a long time, age seven to... Yes, well, it, the era that I grew up in, the location I grew up in, down in southeast Texas, that was that would get you killed. Mm. Even in the military, when I joined in 84, 85, some of the places I was stationed at was the same way. And society wasn't ready for it, and the community I was in, in the Navy, on board the U.S. submarines, really wasn't the place to do it. <laughs> okay. So. From the island perspective, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. I knew at that same early age, maybe somewhere around five or six, I, I knew that I wanted to be beautiful like my mother. I knew that I wanted to wear beautiful things like she did and uh, that I wanted to, I just wanted to be my mother's daughter, but that was never gonna be something that I was gonna be able to say because children at that time would often make fun. And of course, my mannerisms and my everything from A through Z, the way I walk, the way I talk, was just slightly different and as someone who was teased and put down for those things, it was the instinctual thing to do and just go back into myself and not, um, not try to draw too much attention. But then that's the natural, you know, that was a natural me. And sometimes I would go to my mother and, and tell her, you know, I'm bothered by the fact that kids tease me. And she'd then tell me, well, why do you do this? Why do you walk that way? Why do you talk like this? And it was only until later on that I, I allowed myself to just face my reality and say, okay, maybe this isn't something that I was meant to suppress. I should, I should simply embrace it. And at the age, maybe between 17 and 18, um, I found my first boyfriend. I had yet to transition. And I coming from Kamehameha schools, we were always close with our classmates. So I put all the boys that, you know, we, we played sports together, we went to school together, sat them all down and made them wait for at least a good half an hour while I hemmed and hawed, and finally found the courage and the strength to say, I'm seeing somebody, I like somebody, it's not a girl. And their response was, uh, so finally, you admit it. <laughs> we always knew, and we're glad that you are now embracing it. We still love you. You better make sure that he treats you well, otherwise we'll kick his happy self around, okay. and we'll take care of that. And that was the end of it. And, you know, it wasn't that difficult a thing, because that's we were Hawaiian first. To be mahu or to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or anything under that, Western umbrella of mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. is secondary. It's it's rather irrelevant. Yes. We are Hawaiian first. I love that. We need a T-shirt on that. We're Hawaiian first. Lovely. You are a voice for transgender people. What is the message? <clears throat> My message is one rooted here to Hawaii as a native Hawaiian, as a Polynesian, as a Pacific Islander. I come from uh, an immediate and a larger culture that has a clear understanding of sometimes gender neutrality, mm -hmm. sometimes gender expression from one side of the spectrum to the other, and a whole lot of space in between. I come from a culture and a society that when you actually look at our language and our, our oral accounts of history, number one, you don't find negative references 
to people who are yep. mahu, you do not find negative references to iconic relationships and same-sex oriented relationships. And our very basic uh, linguistic understanding is that the pronoun, he, she, and it, are all one word. Depending on what island you come from, it's oya here in Hawaii, and in other islands it's koya, but it's the same word. So he, she, and it are all gender neutral. What is gender language? <clears throat> well, my culture and society, like I said, where I come from, down in pretty much the deep south, and uh, everything was there repressed for a period of time. Was it until I had joined the military and started my traveling? And when I was stationed in Northern California, I started to see more uh, openness and awareness. And then uh, when I came here right after Hurricane Iniki, mm -hmm. that's when I seen a lot of the difference what he was just talking about. <coughs> yeah. The culture, the openness, the acceptedness. And it's like when I came out to my fellow employees at the shipyard, a lot of them pulled me off to the side and told me not to worry, they're happy for me. And if I ever have any problems with anybody, any sailor or anybody employee or contractor working in the shipyard to let them know and they would take care of it. So I, that's something I would never have experienced in the South. So, and that's changing as the years progress and everything. Our society is becoming more open it's a lot of times now, right now, in some places, yes, there's we had all these bathroom bills and stuff, legislation going around. But people themselves, even back home in Texas, are very accepting and very supportive. Can we just all get along? Exactly. Just look at Hurricane Harvey. Yes. I mean, those groups came together as all these different groups and demographics together to take care of their brothers, their sisters, and their neighbors, regardless of who you are, or what you are, or anything else. You're a human being, you needed help, and they offered the assistance. Well, we have a lot to talk about. We're <laughs> gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, you know, children are our future, so we wanna talk about how should we best explain to our children who transgender people are. Keep it here, we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Welcome back to Sister Power, and our episode today is Transgender Voices. And before we went on break, we were talking about the ch children are our future. Yes. How should we best explain to our children who transgender people are? Mm. Hina, you want to take that yeah. one? <clears throat> Explaining to my children that I taught formally at a Hawaiian focused charter school. I spent 13 years at a K through 12 charter school. And we never really focused too much on the topic of transgender because from a cultural perspective, that's 
that's secondary and almost irrelevant. Mm -hmm. We focus on the cultural values of uh, aloha kekahi kekahi, to, to love, honor, and respect one another. Kokua ku kokua mai, to help uh, others and be helped. Uh, laulima, many hands working together. And mahalo ikumi aloha, you know, be thankful for what we have. Those are some of the basic understandings that are part and parcel of the life of Kanaka or the life of being Hawaiian. And when we are Hawaiian and we observe those things, we learn to orient ourselves from the perspective of how we identify is not based on what's between our legs. Hmm. And we do not identify based on what kind of person we want in our lives to be a relationship, whether it be a, a, a nominal touch-and-go relationship or a committed relationship. We identify as, for example, myself, Hinale Moana, I am child of so-and-so and so-and-so, grandchild of so-and-so. I come from this land. and I, um, We articulate the name of the land that we come from, the, the valley or, or the, the part of the island that we are associated with. We identify as, again, Kanaka first. So that places a much different emphasis on what's important. And then when we are actually looking at people for their role in society, we're looking at one another for our skill, our talent, our contribution to not only ourselves, our personal name, but more importantly than ourselves, we're, we're assessed and analyzed by our contribution to our family and to our community. So that is the perspective on Kanaka, and sexuality is merely that. It's sexuality. It's, it has far more room to um, be fluid and to to be embracing of whatever it is that the individual feels calls to them. Well, I have a specific question for you, Valerie. That was deep. That was definitely deep. You definitely covered that, Hina. In 2011, Obama ended the military's don't ask, don't tell yes, he did. policy that prevented gay and lesbian troops from serving openly. In 2017, Trump announces transgender ban for the military. How does it affect troops and veterans? One of the way it affects the veterans is our benefits package, which is tied into our service. Depending on how many years, if we retired, or how many years of service or whatever, depending on what we were discharged, our discharge type and everything else, we all have certain benefits. Uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, has changed, what he's, President Trump is trying to change, is not is the insurance protection, insurance coverage for the veterans. That's pretty much where the big portion of it's going to fit. The other portion that we're going to have issues with is getting our records and our documentations changed to match our legal names. Oh. I cannot, I have to submit a request to change my, the name of my DD-214, which is my discharge papers, and it has to go through a, a year-long review process. And in the Navy, only in the last several years, only three or four people have been allowed to change the name of their DD-214s. Only a few people? Only a few. And we have a picture. Yes. Of, um, it's very interesting. And tell us about the, this picture that we're going to see of your colleagues. Okay, this picture right here was taken in uh, 1998 on board a U.S. submarine I was attached to. We were on deployment in the Western Pacific. We had been on station for approximately 60 days. Uh, I had just got finished uh, conducting training which, as you can tell by the weapons everywhere, is small arms training, and that's my division. And you are the, the I, one holding the big gun? Yes, I am the one with the full beard, the glasses, the great big diver's watch, and holding up the M60 machine gun. M60 machine gun. Okay. Don't mess with her. I, at all. <laughs> I can see that right now. It's very interesting. What has been the most wonderful thing 
to happen to you because you are transgender? I think one of the things that is up there was uh, when I was coming back from Thailand in 2013, we had uh, one of the old submarines I was attached to back in the late 80s, early 90s, was having a reunion in uh, Bremerton, Washington. And uh, I was asked by several of my friends to come to the reunion. <laughs> Only a few of them knew that I had transitioned. And then a couple of the couple of guys who were in charge of us, you better show up. You're here on the mainland getting ready. You got two months before you have to go back to Hawaii. You better show up. So I went. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed at the reception that I had got from my old shipmates, people I served with back in the 88 through 92 at their reception. Uh, and again in 2015, 16, 2016, same group, another reunion. This one was even bigger. And again, I was told by multiple people that I didn't even serve with who were there before I got there and after. And I was told by them, every single one of them, you better show up. And I, that was, I was amazed. And I'm talking mm. people in their 60s and 70s. A lot of love there. Yes. How about you? I, I think that, well, to contribute to what she just said. Yes. I think that this acceptance can come to us in its myriad of forms and, and diverse avenues from the people that will respect us because we contributed something to the larger whole. I don't think that she would have been on high demand if they felt that she wasn't a part of the team. But mm -hmm. that's what happens when you're a part of the team. It's no different from being a Polynesian, a Pacific Islander. You don't necessarily have to articulate being a part of the team. You articulate as being Kanaka. You articulate as being an Islander. And an Islander person, much like someone who's in the military, identifies because everyone has their job. Everyone has their duty. You fulfill your duty to the best of your ability. You, you strive to, to exceed the capacity that you, you set for yourself this time, the next time, and the next time, and you keep pushing, and you keep doing better. In my craft, as, as someone who teaches hula, I teach an incarceration now to men in Alava Correctional Facility and the men in um, Oahu Community Correctional Center, and soon to be um, Federal Detention Center. The reason why I can go into a facility to teach men is because I'm not here trying to focus on my sex, my sexuality, my gender expression. I'm here to focus on the betterment and the empowerment of those inmates whom I come into contact with. It was something that I had to establish clearly with people who perhaps made a comment or made reference to something that insinuated being effeminate, but in a negative way. Mm. I simply had to say, I don't know what you think I'm all about. I don't know what you think I'm here representing, but let me inform you that I'm here to do a job. I'm not here trying to be glamour queen Mm -hmm. and, and trying to gain attention. If I gain attention in here, it's because of the work that I do in here and the quality of what I do. And it is that which I will be scrutinized on. I like that. So what kinds of discrimination do transgender people face? Housing, employment, uh, any and all types of discrimination we face. You know, Hawaii is one of the first states to provide protections against discrimination in the job and in home. That's it. Medical, police, everything. We, it's across the board what people, what we face discrimination in. It's not here. It's just not one thing. It all depends on the state. Some states have a lot of protection against uh, discrimination 
for against transgender people. Some states have none. Some states right now are passing laws to allow discrimination against the transgender community. It seems like we're moving backwards instead of forward. I would agree. Um, here in Hawaii, the history of Hawaii for viewers out there who may be current with not only the political status of Native Hawaiians, but the political status of the islands and the United States of America and its responsibility for um, the illegal annexation of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I hear about the American president, Donald Trump, uh, I can't identify with him as my president because I'm Hawaiian first. And um, if someone were to ask me if I'm an American, I I'm going to say no, I, I'm required to hold an American passport. My mainland is Hawaii. Mm. My mainland is not America. In fact, America is not even the majority of current Americans' mainland. Majority of Americans are immigrants from someplace else. The Native Americans, the Native Indians, are those who are native to that land. But that translates into, back to the question of discriminatory practices against transgender people. The more we subscribe to attitudes and beliefs who's right and who's wrong, mm -hmm. that are contradictory to more of a natural way of being. And I view it, not everybody may agree, but I view it as the more we as Native people become American, Americanized, colonized, the more we subscribe to this kind of approach to being, the more we suffer. Mm. Because then we have allowed Nobody else forced us. We allowed ourselves to do it. So what it really requires is for us to be critical thinkers and to analyze exactly who we are and what we do and why. And that's knowing our self-worth. Yes, exactly. That's what it's all about, knowing your self-worth. Exactly. And one important question I would like to ask the both of you, what is the one thing you want the world to know about you? Judge me by who I am and what I do, not who you think I am. Couldn't have said it any better. I'm telling you, I feel the same way. You know, when I, I, I sit here and we had, we're, we're interacting with mm -hmm. each other, a lot of the discrimination is exactly what my people had to, well, we're still in, in, in dealing with it right now with the discrimination, but housing <clears throat> and uh, employment, it just sounds so similar. And when are we gonna get past all of this? What do you think needs to happen? <laughs> that's a big one. That's, <clears throat> that's, we can't do it overnight, we know that, but we can take baby steps. Well, look, we, we saw uh, the United States of America had the first black president assume control of leadership. But it, it, depending on who you talk to, the change that he promised, the change that he represented, indeed came with him. But mm -hmm. there was a whole lot of people out there who did not want change in that way, in that form, under that name. We await to see a, a, a first woman elected as the president of the United States. Everybody has their opinion on who would and who wouldn't be an appropriate woman leader. Mm -hmm. Imagine the potential for one of the most powerful nations in the world to be governed and led by a different perspective, perhaps one that might actually have some semblance of what it means to truly and sincerely care mm. about life itself. Women, biological women, have the power to give birth. And therefore, I await the day that a biological woman ascends to leadership. The, the current American leadership right now mm. has got to be the epitome all of the worst elements yes. of American culture that we have yet to see. And again, I don't identify as American, but as someone who watches and mm -hmm. understands 
the role of America in the world, um, it would behoove every one of us to consider what are the implications. I always tell people, no matter what the American President Trump does within the confines of the United States, it's more important what he does outside of the United States. And right now, Hawaii is poised to have to yes. be, have preparedness training. Because why? Because somebody's mouth goes it's, like this. It's like I'm back in school in the 60s. Yes. But well, you know, I feel like we're in the 50s. <clears throat> or we have to, yes. you know, the, the drills, get under the desk, get under behind the wall and stuff. And why are we even in this predicament? It's because of the, the, the leadership. Now, every leader is different. I believe that those in, you know, of the American public who supported this president, they did so because he, he represented this, this great change and he represented them. So that, you know, that's scary. It is Because scary. that represents a view that really, to be transgender, there's no place for us in that world. Yes. Well, unfortunately, we have to close soon. Part two. And, you know, and we will have a part two, that, <laughs> that's for sure. But in 10 seconds or less each, what is the one thing, well, I want to ask you this, who do you consider your greatest mentor and why? Can we do that in 30 seconds or less? My greatest mentor, uh, wow. It's several. I would say Janet Mock, Jennifer Finley Bolin, an author, and uh, Tina herself. Yeah. Watching um, her, your movie and, mm. and everything that you were trying to do is, to me, it just inspires me to want to help others. Mahalo. Mahalo. Um, I always give credit to my grandparents who raised me. My Chinese grandparents, both of them, Edith and Henry, my Hawaiian grandparents, Mona and John. But <clears throat> today I'm going to give a shout out to my mother and father. Um, my mother, Georgette, and my father, Henry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize my father, Henry. Um, he taught me unconditional acceptance by virtue of what he did. So... He told me, whatever it is I wanted to do in my lifetime, as long as I took care of my grandmother and I completed school, he'd be completely fine with whatever my life brought me. I love it. And with that said, thank you so much for spending your time with Sister Power. Stay tuned for part two. <laughs> part two. Part Aloha. two. Here we go. Aloha. Thank you for...